This conference will now be recorded. Okay, good morning, brothers and sisters. This is Minister Jerry Spencer from Bank Street Memorial Baptist Church in Norfolk, Virginia. I pray that everyone had a blessed week, and I pray that the day will continue to be a blessing to everyone. Thank you for uh, <clears throat> listening in today, and for those of you who are um, dialing in, I pray that uh, this lesson may be a blessing to you. Um, our study will be coming from Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 9. I'm going to increase my enlarge my PowerPoint screen here so we can go ahead and get started with our biblical study for today. Uh, again, it is coming from Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 9. And this was the um, the chapter and the study that we uh, that I spoke of last week that we will be going through the month of August in the book of Revelation. I met the mission of the International Adult Bible Study brothers and sisters. The ministry is to lead the souls of men and women to Jesus the Christ through the teaching of the word of God, the teaching of the word of God. Now our key verse comes from Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. He will wipe every tear from your eyes. There will be no more death, nor mourning, nor or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Praise God. Praise God for that. Our historical background, brothers and sisters, as we come to a close of the first half of our summer's biblical studies, what better way to end than a brief study in of the believer's new home? New home that's found in the studies of Revelation chapters 21 and 22. Uh, this is a four part study of the last two chapters of the book of Revelation, which translated means a disclosure of truth or instructions concerning divine things before unknown or an uncovering, if you will. Now, we should notice that the book is called Revelation and not Revelations. And it was written by the Apostle John, the one who also wrote the Gospel of John. And near the end of his life, while being banished on the island of Patmos, in the Aegean Sea. And we find that in Revelation chapter one, verse nine. Now, the purpose of this book was to further re reveal <clears throat> the identity of the word of God. Now we talked about uh, who the word of God was in all the month, all the, uh, the month of July. So we know that the word of God <clears throat> and the lamb of God, which was revealed in the gospel of John, chapters one, verse 14, um 29 and 36 is jesus the christ we know that this is why it is called the revelation of jesus christ wrong of revelation chapter 1 verse 1. now decades earlier john had written his gospel for the purpose of showing beyond a doubt brothers and sisters that jesus was the christ the word of god who was god it goes on to say that the book of Revelation was written to give true believers in Christ Jesus, who during the first century suffered under, men, under the Roman authority, encouragement to remain faithful under persecutions. The Lord having warned them, and he warns us also, brothers and sisters, while on this earth, that in this world you will have tribulation or trouble. But the Lord goes on to say, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. We find that in John chapter 16, verse 33. Now, both the gospel of John and Revelation encourages believers in Christ Jesus that if we remain faithful, there is a victory to be won, brothers and sisters. And that this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith according to 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Now, as has been discussed in previous studies in the Gospel of John, 
John was the Lord's closest disciple. He had been eyewitness to the incarnate Christ and was with the other disciples when the Lord ascended back to the Father as Jesus had said he would, according to John chapter 16, verse 10, and Acts chapter one, verse nine. Now, after being exiled on the island of Patmos, John was given a vision of the glory, of the vision of the glorified Christ, whom he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, according to the scriptures, things that would take place in the future. Judgment and the ultimate triumph of God over evil. Now, although we are only going to cover the last two chapters of uh, Revelation, we want to keep in mind, brothers and sisters, we want to keep in remembrance that it was John who said in John chapter, the Gospel of John chapter 21, verse 24, that he was the disciple who testifies of these things, written of the Savior in the Gospels now, and wrote these things, and he goes on to say, and we know that his testimony is true concerning the incarnate word of God, who and who also bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. To all things that he saw in the vision given him in Revelation, things which must shortly come to pass according to Revelation chapter one, verses one and two. And so, brothers and sisters, if there's any part of the, of the book of Revelation that believers need to study most, it is chapters one through four and chapters 21 and 22, which are the two chapters we're gonna be going over today. Why? Because it deals with the church's departure and return in all its glory, all its beauty and splendor. John had been banished on an island in the Aegean Sea called Patmos, where he was given the revelation of Jesus in a vision, in which he wrote this vision, what he had seen, he wrote it down. It is believed that he had been exiled there as a punishment for conducting what one would call forbidden evangelistic work in the city of Ephesus. Now you find that in Revelation chapter one, verse nine. Revelation has three parts, brothers and sisters, three parts. The first part had to do with an appearance of the risen Christ to John, of which he was uh, given instructions to write down the visions that he was about to receive of glorious and mysterious things. He was to later send the letters to the seven churches in the nearby cities of Asia Minor. We found that in Revelation chapter one, verse 11. Now the scripture reveals in Acts chapter one, verses nine and 10, that John was witness to the Lord's ascension back to the Father. So to see the risen Christ as described in Revelation chapter 12 through 17, when John saw the glorified Christ, he fell at his feet as though dead, according to the scriptures. The second part consists of personalized messages to the churches according in Revelation chapter two, verse three. The third part has to do with John's record of, of a series of visions that he was given, visions of heaven and its activities along with prophetic words that were delivered to him by angels who served as his, as his guide. Now our studies will be taken from sections of the third part of Revelation chapter 21 and 22. But first, uh, a, brief, a brief look at chapter 20 provides important information leading up to today's biblical study. The chapter speaks of the final judgment of Satan and the final judgment of men. Chapter 20 teaches us that at the close of the thousand years, or what we would call the scripture of the millennium, Satan will be loosed, according to Revelation chapter 20, verse 3, and verses 7 through 10. 
Now, why he is loosed is not stated, but it is obvious that this was part of God's divine plan. Since there will be people living during the millennium, perhaps it is to show the insincerity of many who had submitted to Christ or to prove that a thousand years in the abyss had not served to change Satan at all. But what we do know, brothers and sisters, is this, is that after, he, after his release, Satan will gather together the nations, what Revelation calls Gog and Magog, and under his leadership, these armies will compass the, the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. This city is no doubt, friends, the city of Jerusalem. But the battle will be almost over as soon as it starts. Fire will come down out of heaven and devour those animals according to Ezekiel chapter 38 and chapter 39. Satan will be judged and consigned to his final place of punishment, which is the lake of fire. The final judgment of men will come when resurrected unbelievers, according to Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, and chapter 21, verse 8, when these men, these, resurrect, these resurrected unbelievers, stand before the great white throne of God. But what's interesting, brothers and sisters, is that this judgment appears to take place somewhere in the skies or the heavens. For we are told that the earth and the heavens fled from his presence in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. The reason being is because of the appearance of the throne with the Lord sitting on it. This judgment, brothers and sisters, deals only with the unsaved. Only with the unsaved. It is at this time that there is the second resurrection, which takes place after the thousand years. Now to sum it up, after the thousand years are completed, Satan will be cast into the lake of fire. The unsaved of men will be judged and all whose names are not found written in the book of life will be cast into the lake of fire according to the scriptures. And lastly, Death and hell, or Hades, is cast into the lake of fire. This is the final place of punishment. The final place of punishment. And to be clear, brothers and sisters, to be clear, this second death is not to be considered an annihilation, but an eternal punishment. You will know that you are there, and you will be there eternally. The soul is never annihilated, but lives on for eternity. Those souls whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will spend an eternity with the creator. Those whose souls, uh, whose names were not found written in the book of life will spend eternity in the lake of fire, according to Revelation. Now, remember, brothers and sisters, remember Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie. And so this takes us to our biblical study for today. We find in Revelation chapter 21, verse 1 and 2, he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. In Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8, first remind, we are first reminded of, of God's goodness towards his people and later towards all nations when the Lord God says that he will do what? He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, you see. So the rebuke of his people, 
he will take away from all the earth. The rebuke of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken according to the scriptures. So remember, brothers and sisters, that it was the Lord who handed down punishment to Adam for his sin and his rebellion, according to Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. So death, my friends, death is a judgment, it is an enemy, and it is a curse, according to Genesis, again, Genesis chapter 3, verse 19, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 26. So the prophet reminds us, however, in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17, that the Lord said this, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. There will be, brothers and sisters, a new Genesis account, a new beginning of new heavens and a new earth, but not a recreation of mankind, not a beginning of the creating creation of man. Sin has spoiled creation. God's promised solution, now that evil has forever been eradicated, is to recreate. Now this recreation will not simply be a makeover, brothers and sisters, for the scriptures tell us that the current heavens are to pass away to make room for the new according to 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 5 through 7 and verse 10. But unlike Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, this new earth will have no sea. The seas were considered hostile places to ancient people, as they often do today, as they often are today. Therefore, it says, having no more seas or sea, symbolizes not just the absence of chaos, horror in the depths and restlessness, but also, also the complete impossibility of such horror reaching into the new Jerusalem. So what John sees is the fulfillment and transcendence of the promise of the Lord God spoken of in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17, and in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 22. But to be clear, brothers and sisters, though they are called new, it does not necessarily mean new in the absolute sense of the word, for the earth abides forever, according to Psalm chapter 104, verse 5, and Psalm chapter 119, verse 90, and Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 4. So the passages of scriptures which speaks of the earth passing away do not signify a passing into non-existence, but rather suggest the idea of complete transition as an analogy as in Mark chapter 13, verse 31. So just as the souls of men and women are not annihilated, neither heaven nor earth will be annihilated. Now, the home of righteousness will soon emerge, according to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13, by the abolishment of evil and the passing away of the first and the first heavens and the first earth. So the holy city, the New Jerusalem, that's said to be the bride, the lamb's wife, according to Revelation chapter 21, verse 9. And John chapter 14, verse 2, and is a figure of speech and is that glorified community of the people of God. In other words, the, the church. The glorified community is the church. According to Galatians chapter 4, verse 26, and Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. And according to the scriptures, the new heavens and the new earth appear after the millennium and at the beginning of the kingdom of the kingdom age so if it's if it's if it's your desire if it's your desire to be a part of this great and eternal event brothers and sisters 
you do well to make every effort to be found what the scripture says, spotless, blameless, and at peace with God. And it goes on to say that the new Jerusalem being prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband, okay, speaks of the beloved community, which is both city and bride, emphasizing the church as being the city whose builder and maker is God, according to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 10, and Hebrews chapter 13, verse 14. And so in verses three and four of Revelation chapter 21, John says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, nor or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away, has passed away. And so when the loud voice from the throne said God's dwelling place would be among his people, this was in stark contrast to what the Lord said in Exodus chapter 33, verse 20, when he told Moses, he says this, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. If an individual lives long enough in this present um, world, brothers and sisters, he or she will experience the shedding of tears that may come from pain or sickness or from wars or from or the actions of evil people. There will be crying and sorrow that comes from the loss of loved ones or friends or acquaintances. They may see or even experience suffering and ultimately death. But in the apostles vision, in the apostles vision, however, something wonderful is about to happen. The he for heaven, heaven bound believers, for heaven bound believers, the present things of this world will never be witnessed again. So whatever we have experienced throughout our life on, lives on this earth, according to revelation, what's about to happen in the future will never be witnessed again. In fact, brothers and sisters, there will be no more remembrance of the past events of this life. This was a great consolation to the martyrs, to the martyred saints uh, of Revelation chapter 7, verse 17, and in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 10. And now, enjoyed by Old and New Testament saints. After seeing the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, according to the scriptures, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband, John hears a voice from the throne of God, telling him of a future when the Lord God of Genesis 1-1, who sits above the heavens, will make his dwelling place among the people of God and will even dwell with them in the new Jerusalem. And so the relationship between the righteous saints and the creator becomes even more personal, brothers and sisters, when God will make his dwelling place among them. Like a father among his children, God will dwell among them and be their God in the new Jerusalem. As Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8 says, and uh, again in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17 states, there will be no more remembrance of the old world and its events. So don't think for a moment that brothers and sisters who are in the heavens, um, that we will have rem uh, remembrances of the things of, past, of our past life on this earth. For the scripture says just the opposite. There will be no remembrance of the things of this life that we live, for the Lord will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, 
or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has done what? Has passed away, has passed away. So in Revelation chapter 21, verses five and six, he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new, or I make all things new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He who will wipe every tear from their eyes and bring to an end death or mourning and crying and pain, promises that he will do what, brothers and sisters, that he will make everything new. This is our creator talking to John now. In Genesis chapter one, verse one, it was the first thought and then the reality of it coming into existence. It was the thought and then the reality of that thought coming into existence. In other words, God had already said and then it happened. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, where John had heard a voice from the throne in verses three and four, in verses five and six, it is the God of creation who speaks directly to the apostle. The thought will once again become a reality. And so brothers and sisters, the repeated words of God guarantee without a doubt that the Lord is faithful and will surely and it will surely come to pass just as it came to pass in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 so certainly it was so so certain was it rather brothers and sisters so, so certain was it that the Lord tells John to do what write this down he says, for these words are trustworthy and true. In other words, God is saying, I make all, I make new heavens and a new earth. And John says, and God says to John, you can count on this. This is trustworthy and true. This is going to happen. This was a promise to the churches who read John's letter in the first century, a promise that was so important, friends, that John was told to write it down. That's how important it was. We know that in Daniel, when Daniel saw the vision, Daniel was about to write it down and he was told not to write it down. Now in Revelation, John sees the vision and John is said, and God, and, and God is telling John to write this down. And so in his day, believers in Christ Jesus had to deal with the dark forces of evil, persecution, and even martyrdom or death. That same, that same evil force or those same evil forces are with us today, friends. It hasn't gone away, they're with us today. But so is the book of Revelation, which is the promise from God, so that we can know that God's words are true and faithful. And so listen carefully, brothers and sisters. Listen carefully to these words. In Isaiah chapter 25, verse eight, he will swallow up death forever and the Lord God will wipe away every tear from all faces. Listen to, again, brothers and sisters, to Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. Listen carefully, brothers and sisters, to Revelation chapter 6, I'm sorry, to Isaiah chapter 66, verse 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord. Again, for as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord. And lastly, brothers and sisters, Revelation chapter 21, verse one. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. So the Lord 
God says to John, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. These scriptures, brothers and sisters, emphasizes the truth and the promise of God. He will make all things new, he says. And so don't miss this. Don't miss this, brothers. And unless you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and have asked him into your life, you will have no part in this glorious and everlasting event. In Revelation chapter 21, verses uh, seven, uh, 6b and 7, he goes on to say, And he said to me, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things or rather overcomes, I shall give him all things. That's another version. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So to be clear, brothers and sisters, though the letters were originally written to the seven churches in Asia Minor and the persecutions that they were enduring, our Lord speaks of all who overcome all who believe in the Lord, not just the first century Christians who were suffering persecutions, because in today's world, believers are still suffering persecution. There are four occasions where the Lord God, the God, where God the Father and God the Son announces that he is the Alpha and Omega. And all four of those are found in Revelation. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, Revelation chapter 1, verse 11, Revelation chapter 21, verse 6, and Revelation chapter 22, verse 13. I am the um, Alpha and the Omega. So that there is no confusion, friends. Although Alpha and Omega are the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet, it is not saying that there is a beginning and ending points for God's existence and reign. It does not say that, but rather that God is both the source and the destination of all things, all things. He is the Lord God Almighty who reigns forever according to Isaiah chapter 44, verse six, according to Psalm chapter nine, verse seven, and Revelation chapter 19, verse six. Psalm 45, verse six writes, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Psalm 93, two, says that the Lord's throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. And it goes on to say that the water spoken of, the water spoken of, brothers and sisters, is rightly understood to be that of eternal life spoken of in John chapter 4, verses 10 through 14. It is the fulfillment of a promise written by the prophet Isaiah, who prophesied spiritual satisfaction for those who seek the Lord, according to Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1. Now, according to John chapter 7, verse 38 and 39, the living water is also the Holy Spirit. It says, he who overcomes shall inherit all things. So this sums up the blessings promised to the victorious confessors in the seven churches of Revelation and to true believers today. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, he says, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexual immoral, immoral, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And so what John is saying, John the apostle gives us 
a catalog of those who are excluded from the blessings of the new creation. It begins with those who through fear have denied the faith in face of persecution. And so what we have before us, brothers and sisters, from an eschatological perspective, which is that part of theology that is concerned with death and judgment and the final destiny of the soul of a man, of soul of men, is a picture of what one might call cosmic house cleaning. Cosmic house cleaning. The cowardly are those who have been afraid to commit fully to Jesus or who confess the Lord but will deny him in face of persecution, according to Mark chapter 4, verse 5. Likewise, the unbelieving are those who refuse to trust the Lord and follow him. The vile and the ab ab abominable, uh, abominable has the sense of being polluted, according to Romans chapter 2, verses 17 through 29. It goes on to say that murderers is a category which in this sense, brothers and sisters, points directly to those who have killed the faithful. Revelation chapter six, verse 10. The sexually immoral are those who violate God's standards for sexual purity. Sorcerers are those who practice magic arts and seek power through spiritual forces of evil and are completely opposed to God. Idolaters can constitute an ongoing threat to the church, brothers and sisters. The worship of man-made images, beasts, and stones, and wood. And so the term liars is more directly related to false believers. So please understand it. The, what we think liars, that term means, is not the same. According to the scripture, the term liars is more directly related to false believers and imposters in the church. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. And we find that also in Galatians chapter 2, verse 4. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Jude chapter 4. And Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. And so that's what that term is, is defined, is described as. Not necessarily to those who would tell a lie, in other words. Their final place of existence is also the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which the scripture says in Revelation is the second death. And so in verse 9, we find that in, uh, let me go back here. Let's see, verse nine, it says, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came. He came. Now, this angel <clears throat> is first spoken of in Revelation chapter 15, verse one, where he is one of the seven angels with the seven last plagues. Last, because with them, God's wrath is completed. That is the completion of God's wrath. And in, we find it also in Revelation chapter 15, verses 6 and 7, where it says, out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And verse nine, God continues to say, and he said to me, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. Now this is important because although we won't get to all of it today, we'll be finishing up in a few minutes, but we're gonna go into a lot more detail next week concerning the bride, and the wife of the lamb. <clears throat> and so the lamb, the angel then shows John through a mixture of metaphors that the beloved community that we now know as the church is portrayed 
as both the bride or wife of the lamb, and it is also the city. Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 and 8 writes this, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride, the church, the church, has made herself ready. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 10, which is where we are, are going to start next week, John writes that he will carry, he, he says that he carried me away in the spirit to a, a mountain great and high <clears throat> and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, doing what, brothers and sisters? Coming down out of heaven from God. Now, we will continue next week with part two of this study starting with Revelation chapter 21, verse 10. And we're going to talk about this <clears throat> holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. We're going to talk about who the bride or the wife is and the city. We already know, according to our studies today, that it is the holy communion. It is that community of, of saints. It is the church which consists of both Old and New Testament believers that is that is spoken of here. And so we're going to go into that in a lot more detail next Sunday. So with that, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> let us let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for blessing us to, Lord, just to be here today, to hear your word, to study your word. We know, Heavenly Father, that your word is truth. We ask, Father, in the name of Jesus, to open our hearts and our minds and give us an understanding of your holy word. Lord, that everything that have breath praise the Lord this day. We thank you, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus for the blessings of this day and for your holy word. We praise you, O Lord God, most of all, for sending Jesus into this world to save mankind and to just bring the gift of salvation and eternal life. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Have a blessed day, brothers and sisters. Amen.